I've set it up so that there is a corner that is uh, a corner that puts it. No, we're not. It's just the camera. They're both wearing blue. Um, there we go. That should be safe. Good look here. Yeah, good look on. <laughs> it's short and back. That's the thing that's straight. Oh, you're there. Look at this. 
you know, kind of like these type of dishes and make sure that you And then uh, transition to the external generation for the same thing. Uh, and then do what every good web application does, which is you take one more business logic out of the website and put it into microservices. Put it in like this microservice architecture behind it. And we feel again great gift binding with Facebook. So, in other words, just went to Facebook. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been working. 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 But Facebook also has to develop. Wrong, wrong question. But Facebook also never give her But Facebook also has to develop all the infrastructure. Right. I just get to use it. No, he wrote No, he wrote No, not he needs some tie pie. No, the guy wrote a speech. Hold on. They had a chicken. What was it? No. Yeah, the guy. There was a guy who was like, "I was in the university." Of There's a higher art of the talent. Like, Where's what? <laughs> no, it doesn't. have the best view, so you grab them while they're hot. Peninsula number two. It's zero index. This is the third Peninsula. Uh, my name is Matthew Deshami, uh, and uh, we have organizers Mark and Moshe. If you have questions, but um, let's see. Quick bit of logistics. Is there a restroom? There is. Out across the hall. Yeah, I'll be back. No. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, Peninsula endures. Uh, we have a great lineup of three speakers for you tonight. Uh, hopefully, you all found the place okay. And uh, you know, these are sort of short talks. Wait. Quick question. How many of you, this is your first Peninsula? Okay, like a lot of you. How many of you have been to all the Peninsulas? Oh wow, we got some value turnover right here. Uh, but <laughs> no, um, yeah, we had a good time. Uh, and uh, But since Globality is our host, it's sort of traditional that the host gives a talk or at least says something. 
And uh, indeed, our very first speaker is uh, Jesse from Globality itself. And he's going to be talking a little bit about uh, convention-driven microservices. So, uh, you know, it sounds pretty interesting to me. Um, anyone here run microservices? Like, Globality people, you can keep your hands down. So, it's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we certainly run where I'm at. Uh, and so, yeah, looking forward to it. All right, everyone put your hands together for Jesse. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, this is the first time we've had an engineering-focused event here. First time we've had a meetup here, and it's great to see so many people here. Uh, I want a quick thank you to Ellison and Connie and Tall, etc., for helping us set this up because uh, we got a bunch of good stuff. Um, and I need to quickly describe uh, what Globality does. Otherwise, uh, Ron, who's our CTO, will probably kill me tomorrow. Um, <laughs> So Globality is in the business of making globalization work for everybody. And by everyone, we mean specifically not really large, big corporations. Uh, so it's a really interesting company to be at uh, because there is a very purpose-driven mission to what we're doing. Uh, and if you think about global trade, which most people don't, uh, it is something where it's dominated by large companies. It's not made by large companies, not because they're the best at what they do, but because they're well known or they have some sort of market advantage because they're large. Uh, and so what Globality is trying to do is to make that market work for small and medium sized companies, specifically because they are better at what they do, have the best people, the best outcomes, and usually a lower price. Um, so really fun place to be. If you're interested in working here, come talk to me, come talk to Ron afterwards. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about our engineering core technologies uh, and a little bit about me, myself as well. So um, I've been writing services professionally for about 15 years. I'm currently the chief architect at Globality, which means I actually write a hell of a lot of code. Um, it's not an abstract 10,000 foot architecture job. It is a get down and dirty and figure out what was actually not working and make it work. I, I tell everyone who I interview that my job is to make all the stuff work. And that's both people and technology. Um, about 10 years ago, one of my coworkers started running Python for little, little you know, automation scripts. And somehow I fell in love and found that it is just a much better language for me personally. Uh, before when I first started my career, I was writing C++, moving to Java. <laughs> Things are better now. Um, philosophy is that software architecture is all about people, and I mean both end users and especially employees and coworkers. So most decisions that we make, all decisions we make, are about what is best for either us personally or our users who we are trying to serve. Um, I think that that is actually somewhat novel, um, and I'm going to get into details. I hope. Um, I think that when you have the right culture, the right values, the right architecture, and a great team, you can do just about anything, and I'm excited about globality in that regard. Uh, okay, so some numbers. I'm going to give some numbers because this is talk about microservices, and microservices are not something you do because it's faddish, it's something you do because it helps solve a particular problem. So globality has been around for less than two years, or about two years. I've been here since about last February. Some of the early code doesn't exist anymore. So you can have some idea how much time actually went into writing code. In that time, we've easily written 500,000 lines of code. Um, this is surprisingly hard to calculate, but it's a lot. Uh, we have at least 90 Git repositories we work with, which is also a lot. And we only have, okay, about 25 Python services that run in production and only about 20 developers. So the reason for microservices is, first of all, every service is small. So you can theoretically figure out what it does in a small amount of time. I would say, even more importantly, people are really bad about sticking to interfaces unless you make them. Uh, so I've had coworkers in the past who were, like, were really excited about large monorepos. And they said, oh yeah, we just draw lines here and people can't cross those lines. And people always cross those lines. There is nothing better than saying code 
is in separate repos and code talks across a network to make sure people stick to interfaces. Um, but really, <coughs> the reason for microservices is organizational philosophy. With 20 people and the volume of code that we have at Globality, the only way to solve the problems that matter to the business, not the problem, is to put people on problems, not put people on technology. You can't have a team of people who know how to, let's say, write reports, and then not have a month go by where reports are important. Like, it doesn't, the math doesn't work. You have to put people on the problem that matters, which means that the technology that people work on has to be flexible. People have to be able to move around and to work on something they've never seen before, which is why having a small surface area is important. So uh, this is a talk about microservices. It's a talk about how we approach that. And I want to start with a actual real example problem <coughs> of how running software across at scale becomes hard sort of suddenly. Um, most people have done Python logging. Raise your hand if you've written Python logging. Adam, come on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, coming from Java or C++, this is a huge improvement. Uh, you can't just import batteries included. Logging is there. Um, so that's nice. But this doesn't actually work. We need to configure your logging. OK, now it will actually output something. That's nice. Still not really there yet. Because you probably need some sort of log format that tells you something about what you logged. <coughs> um, even this isn't really good enough because that name value there, what's it going to say? It's going to say root by default. So if you want to have something better than that, you end up writing something like this. This is not the code we actually run, but this is the code that I wrote as an example, where you inspect your current function, your current class, or all of the above, and inject that into your logging context. And this is just one more step in making a very small concern of your application work properly. And then there's a lot more. You need to figure out what logging levels to use. In my opinion, there's only four levels of logging that make sense. There's debug, which is what you do personally on your locally. There's info, which just shows up all the time, preferably once per meaningful context. There's warning, which something someone is going to look at the next day because it goes in their email box. And there's error, which means people are going to wake up and be, be alerted. Just about anything else is meaningless because you can't act to it differently. So you have to make all your code work that way. You have to add more metadata. Something logs, you need to know where it came from. What service is this? What machine is it on? Uh, what network is it in? You end up wanting log aggregation because your machines become, are, are cattle, not pets, and you have to have lots of machines all over the place. And so you go into some, some, logly, some system like Logly, which is what we use. And you have one of those JSON, so it's parsable. Uh, and then you also want to make sure your customer data doesn't show up there because that's part of your, your SLA or your whatever. And the next thing you know, you have something sort of like this, which is an actual logging configuration using Python dict config. And even this isn't really complete. So why am I saying all this about logging when I'm talking about microservices? I'm saying that because in order to make an actual service work in real life, there are tens of things like logging. And each of them has the same level of complexity. So you have to figure out how to talk to a database, how to gather your stats and metrics, where you're going to show your config and secrets, how you're going to monitor things. And you start having common patterns, things like basic CRUD operations, basic persistence, all of the above. Um, and now multiply that by every microservice you have. I said at the beginning, we have 25 microservices in production right now. So you potentially have 25 different copies of basically that same bit of logging config multiplied by 10 different things you care about, logging databases, metrics, blah, 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 blah. And it blows up. And it blows up in a lot of interesting ways. Uh, the first thing is that you're constantly changing what you think is the best practice. So you have one service that has the logging configuration you wrote two years ago, another one, the one you wrote yesterday, and they're not consistent. On top of that, you have people who are running a new service, and they don't know where to look for for the best practice, so they go copy something. And it's not quite what it should have been, but it's close, and so it's kind of good enough, but it's not good enough, and it ends up breaking something. And the more, even, even bigger, and probably the deepest problem is the human problem. 
I said at the beginning, this is about people and architecture is about people. You want your team to be productive and they don't know what they're supposed to do because you have so many examples of doing things differently. So that is the problem that I, as an architect, care about solving. And the solution is convention. And the solution is basically figure out how to do something well, write some code that knows how to do that, put that somewhere that you can share, make as much as possible work by default, and wire it into everything. You have some versioning, some testing to do, but you can basically have the right answer for logging, the right answer for databases, whatever, exists in some library. All of your, piece, your code gets that. The next time you release that solution, everything gets it and it keeps working, as long as the boundaries between things are well-defined. So how do we achieve this panacea? Um, there are multiple ways. You don't have to follow the one that we chose. Um, the first thing that comes to mind, if you are coming from a Java background like mm -hmm. I am, is dependency injection. This is a well-known solution for this kind of problem. And it's a solution that no one in the Python world thinks is the right solution. Um, I'm not sure why that is. I've read some, some posts about uh, it being the wrong choice because Python imports and modules work well. Uh, I've read it being the right choice because Python is explicit and simple and dependency injection is not. I don't really buy any of that. But I also don't think the dependency injection libraries that are out there are any good. Um, the pinject library is the best one I've found. I think it's really well written, but I think it solves some of the wrong problems. Uh, a lot of these problems, so a lot of these solutions try to solve problems from the point of view of someone who's coming from the Java world, which is to say everything is a class. You're only going to inject classes into your application, which is wrong. Uh, and you really need to care about how you handle like really complicated things. Like, oh, I might have this in this case, and this in this case, and this in this case. But the reality in a microservice is it's a small surface area. And so you just don't have that problem. You can be a lot simpler. Um, and I'll say plug the last thing especially. One of the most important things you have to do is take your configuration and turn that into code. And most DI solutions I've seen, even the ones in the Java space, do that rather poorly. They don't really have an opinion about what configuration looks like. They let you hang yourself in that. There are lots of frameworks out there. If you have a framework you love, go for it. I don't. Uh, I've tried some. I found that they tend to push me in directions I don't like, and I want something that's minimal. Um, so Microcosm, this is our solution. It's open source. It's on our GitHub page. You go to code.com, you can see a bunch of things about how it works. Uh, basic idea is mostly stolen from the pinject library, but written in a different way. We have a graph of objects basically a, bunch, a registry of names to objects, things we want to use in our application. We have a configuration loading mechanism for pulling configuration from various sources. We use that to create objects using a registry of factories. We have a couple of other nice little hooks in there around passing data between these things for logging and other kinds of diagnostics. And the, on the whole, that's all that it does. The whole thing is a couple of Python files because what we actually do is we put all the other things in our system into other libraries. We have a library for working with Flask, which is our choice for the web. We have a library for working with Postgres. We have a library for working with SNS and SQS with PubSub. We have a library for a whole bunch of different things. Uh, and so we found that this is a really nice way to have a decoupled, loosely tied system that solves that problem of how your microservices do a bunch of things without it becoming out of hand. So some examples, because code is important. Uh, this is the basic interface for microcosm. Uh, you've got the idea of a binding, which is just a name, just a string. Microservices are really small. You can pick a unique string. You won't run into conflicts. If you do, you can change a string. It's not a problem you have to solve. You have some defaults, because you want defaults. You want the system to be, require a minimal amount of configuration. You have a function that takes the object graph, which is the thing that contains all the things you care about. And it produces something else that can attach to the object graph. And that something else can use the config. That's the basic pattern that we use, and it's been really successful. The usage is make me an object graph, and then I want to access something. And the graph is, says, do I have this thing? No, nope, I don't. OK. Do I have something registered that knows how to make this thing? Oh, I do. OK, go make it. The end. Logging, that's all. Because <laughs> behind the scenes, there's some function that knows how to build that giant dictum thing I showed you guys before. 
Uh, we solve the naming problem this way. There's a little decorator built in. It's not required to use it, but ends up nice. Database access. This builds you a SQL Alchemy engine that talks to Postgres. <clears throat> There's a bunch of things we think are useful, like health, like, um, well, I forget, but it's useful. <laughs> uh, a little more complicated, we get into the world of web, web requests. Um, this ends up being complicated because you have to define more things, but there isn't actually a lot here. So we chose Marshmallow as a way to define our encodings over JSON over the wire. So in this case, I've defined a person which has a single name field. So you can imagine that as a JSON dictionary, key name, value, whatever name you choose. A function that takes some inputs and returns some data. In this case, it's returning a list of things that have a name and the total number of things. That's an internal convention we've chosen. We're working on supporting not just counts there, but also sort of token-based pagination. That's a whole other story. And then at the bottom, we say, make me an object graph. Use Swagger convention. I'll get back to that in a second. Configure this graph with a endpoint of type search with this person schema and run. Um, a lot of this ends up getting hidden in your overall application creation so that when you're defining a route, you're really only defining the schema definition, the function, and the mapping. Um, why do we do this instead of just writing a simple Flask route? I'm going to switch to – I'm switch to demo. How do I do this? Uh, let me fix it out of the presentation. Apologize. Um, there we go. All right. So this is so you can see that basically the same code I just showed you guys. I'm going to run class server. I'm going to now make a request and figure out my announcement. Not working. It's full screens. Okay. Uh, so I go to This is sort of the punchline. Uh, Swagger, people know what Swagger is? Hands, if you don't know what it is. Awesome, people don't know what it is. Swagger is a way of defining an API, usually over HTTP, usually in a sort of restful-ish way. Uh, the reason why you do this is because then you can generate code that talks to that API. So what I have here is auto-generated from our code. So. I use some convention that's built into Microcosm. I wired it in because it's a well-known name that's in a factory that just populates. And the way that I create my routes is such that everything is classified and it knows what I'm doing. I didn't have to write a Swagger document to define what APIs I have and separately write my code and risk them being out of sync. I wrote my code once and Swagger just happened. And what's nice about that is now we can have code that knows how to talk to our API that's generated by asking the system, what do you support? Uh, so back to the top title of this, top, of this talk. This is about convention-driven microservices. So microservices have a bunch of problems. I'm arguing that they are solved to some degree by having a really good configuration system. And if you have a really good configuration system, you can inject conventions that make your life really easy so you don't have to do the same thing over and over again or write a lot of code. <coughs> Uh, and that is hopefully the end of the talk. Thank you. Any questions? Can you give me some?
some examples of your microservices? Sure. So uh, our business is about global trade. Uh, we work with companies. Uh, so we have a service that knows about the companies. Uh, as part of making this global trade work, we are trying to match certain kinds of companies, companies that want to do work with companies that can provide that work. So we have a service that knows how to calculate matches. In the course of doing that work, those two companies might chat. The service knows about like chat. Uh, they might sign a contract, which was about contracts. They might want to build out a proposal. We have that. We want to do payments. We have that. Um, what am I missing, guys? Files. Files. We want to upload files. What? Video chat. Video chat. We want to do that. Uh, we might yeah, want to do search. Uh, what was that? <laughs> access control is a big one. Access control is a ton of fun. If you ever come interview here, I will ask you about access control because it's a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that good enough? Yeah. All right. Anything else? Yeah. In microcosm, what's the difference between graph.use and graph.mother? Is mother special in some way? Uh, so, I am abusing, we are abusing the get adder access. Yeah. So when you say graph.logger, you implicitly go check a cache, see whether the logger's there. If it's not there, you go check a registry to see whether the factory for that. If you don't, if you have that, then it makes one. Graph.use is just a way of saying ref it lazily evaluate these references all at once. So we use that at startup time in our applications to make sure everything loads as early as possible because you really don't want things to fail to load later on. There's also a little mode where you can lock the graph such that any subsequent reference will fail aggressively in case you didn't configure it properly. And then you can run unit tests to make sure that you, your configurations all load, and then you're very unlikely to start up improperly. Yeah? Um, so really cool library, um, and if uh, you're ever kind of looking for inspiration, I would say, about kind of similar things. It reminds me a lot of uh, some closure libraries, like the components and uh, mounts and kind of things they use for configuration management. So like closure is like a hard, like functional, like programming yeah. language, right? And the eight state, but you need like inherently stateful like, things, like you know, database connections or whatever. And then so like kind of the thinking was they need to bring in some of like kind of objects uh, like kind of paradigm to manage these types of things. And so there's the libraries that kind of out. So uh, uh, yeah, if you're like kind of just like kind of interested in like some of things maybe, but I don't know, mind block. Well interesting. I have followed closure to the degree that I've seen Rich Nicky speak a few times and been, been really impressed, but I've never written it. I definitely don't know those libraries, but it's a great good idea. All right. Thank you guys. All right, thank you. Now what now? Can you want to do it? Okay. All right. Cool. Um, so a few announcements. This is um, Moshe. Hey, yeah, I'm Moshe. I'm also one of the organizers. It's Mark and Mahmoud. Um, so um, first of all, May, uh, we are not going to have a meetup, uh, mostly because people will either be in PyCon or tired for PyCon. Uh, Wait, raise, raise your hand if you go to PyCon. Okay, we should probably exchange contact information, but all right. Uh, yes, um, I do recommend that if you are not going to PyCon, uh, you can watch everything. It will be up on Py Video uh, pretty much a day later. Uh, so you can watch all the most of the tutorials and all the talks, and a lot of those things are really fun. Uh, and in that vein, uh, in June, um, we will have a panel. We're still kind of working on the details of the panel, but we will have a panel discussing uh, interesting talks at Peninsula, so at uh, sorry, PyCon. So if you have not watched uh, videos, hopefully you'll get uh, uh, more ideas uh, for the panel. If you have, you can come and uh, um, uh, talk about them as well. I really recommend the videos. Basically, like if you need a lunchtime activity, you know, you got pizza coming in, you just like sort of go in the conference room, watch a video, the conference comes to you, you know. Moshe's given a talk, I know you love him, so Aww. you can see more of him. Uh, but uh, yeah, if you want to learn about AWS. And uh, Mark is giving a talk about uh, Stateless. 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 awesome, yeah. So, um, and uh, in June, so uh, as I said, we will resume. Uh, we have a meetup at Box, 
I think we already have some of the tentative details, enough that you can already RSVP. Um, like I said, one of the things will be a panel. We're still trying to figure out the talk schedule. Uh, if you do have something you really want to talk about, come talk to uh, Mahmoud, Mark, or me. Um, am I forgetting anything important? Um, July, um, details are not set yet, but hopefully we're going to have a hack night, like a project night. So much like SF Python project night, if you've ever been there. Uh, if not, basically, uh, the idea is to kind of help introduce to, uh, uh, Python to people who, uh, I guess, are less comfortable with that. So uh, there will be tutorials, which are just you know people going off and talking about each other. There will be projects. I can just chat. Um, it's really kind of a fun social experience. Mm -hmm. You know what That sounds good to me. Yeah. I think uh, this has to be a short announcement period because I think we're going to catch up with time. Yeah, of course. Uh, uh, so. Uh, the next uh, interval, um, we will have time for you to talk about if there's anything that is, that is on your mind that's related to Python or this community. That's true. Uh, so think about it while um, who's our next speaker? We have Robot Framework talk coming Robot up. Framework, yes. okay. That's Robot you. Framework. Come on up. You got a you got an HDMI capable laptop. Yep. All right. <laughs> David, it's me. While David sets up, uh, yeah, um, basically the first level is like announcements, and you know, if anyone is like hiring aside from globality, we can like mention that too. Usually, we reserve the second and, intermission. And if you like, if you're looking for a job, and if you're looking for a job, right? Uh, by all means, uh, no change here, right? We've all been looking for jobs. It's exciting, like that. But uh, basically, yeah, and then the second intermission is like if you have any projects or anything like that, we do like little two to five minute lightning talks. So if you have anything that you've been working on or are excited about, right, you can get that queued up if you have your laptop. Um, but yeah, any other like sort of announcements, hiring? I'll tell you the shock takes hiring if anyone's looking to make a change and, you know, have a 10 minute longer commute or shorter up the road on Middlefield uh, to Redwood City. What's that over there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so, I mean, everyone's hiring, and uh, yeah, so basically, if you're looking, then, I mean, look no further, I guess. <laughs> I get my card. Uh, while David set it up, yeah. uh, well, one thing I did forget to uh, mention. Sure. Um, yes. Um, so we have a code of conduct. It's pretty much a ripoff of the PyCon code of conduct. It's itself a ripoff of the uh, geek feminism. Uh, code of conduct. Um, you know, hopefully it's uh, pretty much common sense stuff. Uh, you know. Uh, Otherwise, yeah. most is gonna get after you. Basically, <laughs> if you plan on presenting like you know, a future peninsula or during the next intermission, like try to keep it PG thirteen. Uh, you know, I thought Jesse did a great job. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> be like Jesse, and you'll be fine. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and specifically, uh, if you want to uh, interview someone. Uh, you know, like interview people about, um, you know, for a paper or project or whatever it is to do. Uh, feel free to come up and talk to the announcements and have people reach out to you. Uh, but don't go uh, harassing people into interviews. That tends to make people uncomfortable. Yeah. That sounds good. All right. David, how are we looking? We're getting there. Getting there. All right. Um, I plugged in the HDMI. Oh, I got to. Just more things, I guess. Sure. It just works. Uh, okay. Uh, so, let's see. More announcements. I mean, I'll be at PyCon Web. I'll, I'll tell you that. If you're going to be in Munich about a week after PyCon. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, it's probably hard to get to and from Munich. You know, but I hear you. it's that East Germany thing still like you know catching up. Let's see. Yeah, let's see. Uh, always the, yeah, other three times. Other interesting things. Uh, I don't know why everyone interprets what I do as saying a comedy. I just have a certain tone in my voice that tends to make me. Yeah. <laughs> Every day I go home and look in the mirror, I wonder, like, why are people laughing when I say it? Very important, serious business. Uh, yeah. 
No, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty good at stalling. It makes me like really good software engineer, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm it's taking a little bit longer than you expect, so you got to learn how to. <laughs> Exactly. You stretch your words out. It's real long. Um, yeah. Anything else will do it. Let's see. I, I can give somebody a ride to the train. Yeah. Ride, That's a good announcement. Okay. Ride, ride sharing. Ride sharing. I can give somebody a ride to the train because we're a little bit further from the train than the last two meetings. That's true, actually. Usually we like to sort of uh, are co located with the uh, Cal train station because. The whole reason why Peninsula exists, if it isn't clear, is that the Bay Area is a nightmare to commute in, right? So, like, there is, in fact, a meetup in the South Bay, and there is, in fact, a meetup in, like, San Francisco. But, like, you know, because 101 is the way it is and Caltrain is the way it is, right? We have a geographic, uh, like, sort of lock on the market. Uh, so, Peninsula was born. Um, I'm sorry I gave away the secret much. No, no, that's well, the whole philosophy of, 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 of Peninsula, to avoid extremes. Yeah, the, the middle, the, you know. The middle, uh, the middle of the, the, the like, mid, West the middle Bay. Ground, right? and and, you know, the, the, the shows, of, the, the talks are not too short and not too long, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's I should amazing. announce, I mean, you're giving your PyCon talk at Bay Piggies in two days. Oh, yeah. So yeah. there are three PyCon talks that are being delivered at Bay Piggies, which is in Sunnyvale. It's not even that far. Uh, and uh, so if you're interested in seeing more of this and longer talks, mind you, then, um, you know, you know where to get it. It's going to be a five in California. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 Is that, 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 is Right. Yeah, Let's give it a second. Once more, I get recruiting emails from both. Once more, email from both. Lift or lift and over both pipes on stack. Um, I don't think Uber does enough. I don't know. I get Uber emails. Maybe just Uber eats. I mean, it ain't. I probably got a big enough. Oh! Woo! Oh. 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 Close, close. You're not allowed to see that. Yeah. 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 Oh, yes. the group is. Oh, the group is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The However, Bay Piggies had a coup a year ago. But it, it... So, okay, <laughs> I'll tell you the story about Bay Piggies that was very confusing for everyone who was in the, in the meetup slash mailing list. Uh, apparently, somebody like did a semi uh, forcible takeover. It was like the opposite of that. We see the organizers like got very lax, something Moshe would never do. And, uh, <laughs> and um, you know, someone else came up and was like, hey, I'm excited about, like, you know, this meetup, and I would like to help out. And then they managed to um, take over the meetup and then uh, turn it into a paid event. They started charging people, and they, re and they renamed the day Priggies. Uh, yeah, which, I, I mean, I don't even know. Like, I just really click on Okay, anyways, so... Uh, <laughs> close. Close, okay, yeah. So, anyways, uh, but that was, that was pretty weird. But eventually, through some help at Meetup, they managed to wrest it back from the control. Oh, the Python! Oh, okay. Python wow! The Python uh, Software Foundation owns the trademarks and, and oh. URL, so it's hard to get Python to work on it. Yeah, it's like a property. Intellectual property is doing something good for once. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, um, all right. Well, without further ado, David, you ready to go? It looks like you're ready sure. to go. Okay, we're just going to. It'll break halfway through. <laughs> yeah, this is a good break. Uh, so I'm David Smith. I'm a QA director at Phantom, uh, and we create a security automation platform, which the user-facing side is actually largely Python, as well as the test framework I've set up. So the question to you guys is, how many of you are developers? Raise your hand. Uh, figures. <laughs> Come to a Python group, know your audience. How many are testers? I mean, every oh, developer, right. every so developer who actually <laughs> tests their stuff. So you're developers who test your own stuff. And right? we have to deploy it sometimes, too. <laughs> so um, I actually have a, a, an EE background, and I started using Robot Framework 
uh, testing network hardware. Uh, so I've actually, I'm, I'm pretty good at, you know, taking a hammer and a nail and using it for something completely wrong like metalwork. I do the wrong things with the right tools sometimes. Uh, one of the things, so the testers, how many of you use a already existing open source framework to do your testing? Is it Cucumber? Is it Robot Framework? Oh, you got a couple. Okay, sweet. I'm in good hands. Something, what, it, what, a, what is it that you use? So people use PyTest and unit tests for right. things that aren't unit tests. Right. <laughs> so hopefully by the time I'm done, you'll understand why you're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> that, there's a reason I'm sitting here. But no, there actually is nothing that's wrong. And actually, one of the beauties about Robot Framework is you can do your tests or whatever you want in whatever language you want and whatever thing you want to do it in. If you put it in that framework that actually, and I'll get to it, that it helps you accomplish your end goal, basically. Um, speaking of open sourcing, I've open sourced this entire presentation from the kind people at Nokia. Actually, I was looking at building my own for this. And I, I was looking at the one that they had on their site, and this is literally the robot framework intro on the robot framework site. There really isn't a better way to give people like a first high level view of, of what it is and what it does. Uh, it is a generic automation framework. Uh, so it can be used, like I said, hammer, nail, metal work. Uh, it can be used for acceptance driven development, testing. It can be used for whatever you want, basically. It is just a framework. Try not to think about what language it's written in, although it's Python, which seems appropriate for who we all are. Uh, it can do Iron Python, Jython, I don't even know how to pronounce it. It's Jython. Uh, it can be extended with whatever you want to throw at it. Uh, other languages, it, uh, there are Selenium libraries. There's a huge open source community that's active and working on it. Um, I actually looked at this and Cucumber and made this one my friend, although Cucumber has its merits as well. Um, this is a high-level architecture diagram, so pretty straightforward. You've got the very bottom, what you're trying to test. Uh, originally, I was using it for actually network hardware. Now I use it for Phantom, which is a purely software product. Uh, above that, you have your layer of testing, so your tools, your test libraries, then robot framework, and then test data. The best thing about robot framework, you write clear text test cases that pretty much anyone should be able to read. Uh, sometimes they get a little convoluted and complicated, but that's my own fault when I design the test. Uh, but literally, what you read is what you get out of the test. Uh, this is a good quick example, in fact, although it doesn't do anything. Uh, open browser to page, put in a username, put in a password, submit. Web page should be open. That's the actual test criteria. And then tear down, et cetera. So uh, one of the things that, um, let's see, in a higher level of detail that it handles for you is it automatically handles all the error handling and timeouts and reporting and everything else that you would actually want to be part of your test system instead of you having the right code to do it for you. So data-driven test example, so invalid username. So you have choices, invalid username, valid password, valid user, et cetera. You, you basically can create keywords that do the various combinations of testing that you actually want to do. Uh, Gherkin syntax, again, so valid login. Given if the browser is open to a login page, when the user demo logs in with password mode, then welcome page should be open. So again. You've got what is your test case scenario, when should that happen, and what is the result. Uh, you can create series of keywords. Again, this is actually pretty much what you would have in a test case, but the very simplistic uh, guts of it. Um, you can have a keyword that says open to open browser to the login page. Uh, or login page should be open, input username, input password, and these become reusable keywords throughout the rest of your test cases. So you can very quickly create a library of code for whatever it is you're testing that you can then reuse in other test cases. 
Uh, here's a, a snippet from the actual Selenium library that comes from, uh, or that is for Robot Framework, uh, just to kind of give you an idea if any of you do UI testing. Um, the, the same back end, basically, you have a Python library, you create a class, you create your, your functions within it. Those all become available effectively as keywords. So if we go back and look at this case, uh, here we have uh, input text or title should be. So in this case, you say login page should be open. Well, title should be login page. So that's exactly pulling it from your own library that you built or from one that you've chosen uh, to import. Uh, this is just a, a simplistic example showing how you can handle some variables. You create them by literally typing in the variable name you want and the value. Uh, or you can override from uh, command line. Uh, you can tag all of your test cases. You can tag them in, uh, in a manner that is not just by test case by itself, but by a hierarchical manner. Um, I use this extensively to make sure that I can test various sections of my platform uh, one at a time if I want, or also in the reports I can grab complete statistics for a certain set of tags, I'll show you that in a moment, what it looks like. But here's a, just their generic screenshot of test reports. I'm gonna show you a better one. There's also detailed logs, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, they have a complete set of standard libraries. So there's operating system libraries for handling file system operations, directory listings, find, etc. cetera. Uh, you can take screenshots. Telnet, SSH, whatever it is, there's probably already a library for the interface that you need to other devices uh, or systems. Um, external licenses or external libraries obviously must be installed separately. You can have Selenium, you can have SSH library, HTTP library. Uh, in my case, I have the uh, Phantom generator for Phantom, which creates uh, random data for our platform that helps me test the platform. Um, and you can have project and team specific, of course. Uh, this one shows, so they have a ride editor, which is the robot framework editor that some people like to use, um, which basically a UI to help you create test cases. This one in particular, uh, I looked at, I haven't looked at it recently. I'm sure it's gotten much better in the last two years since I looked at it. I actually prefer Eclipse. Uh, and part of that is there's a robot plugin for Eclipse. You can open a test case. Uh, it shows you where you've, you know, grammatically or, uh, or basically made spelling errors or, or I'll, I'll show you in a moment, the uh, formatting errors. Uh, but bottom line is there's plenty of plugins for whatever tool you like. Um, the other beauty of Eclipse is it's already got a million other plugins for other things. So if I'm editing a JSON file, I can look at the JSON file and see exactly what the formatting is that's wrong, uh, Python, etc. So the easy integration portion, these are all created, uh, test suites are created from files and directories, and I'll show you a good example of that. Uh, command line interface, which uh, I've done a good job of hiding from myself using Jenkins. Um, the tests are all output, the results are actually all output in XML, uh, which is then reformatted into the reports that they provide you. So at any time, you can actually go back and write your own script and generate your own reports or statistics, whatever you want out of that. Uh, and then there's, of course, plugins for other build tools. So there's that. I'm not showing you the do's and don'ts. Today was meant to be just like the super high level intro to what is robot. Um, be more than happy to go into greater detail if you guys would like. You have about five minutes left if you'd like. I've got some things to show you. Okay. I'm not done yet, don't kick me off. <laughs> I'll show you my recycle bin first. <laughs> So I've got uh, what is the test results folder from a particular test suite uh, where I've, you know, happily saved a whole bunch of garbage. There's screenshots, uh, the Phantom Eula page from Selenium drops in here. Uh, 
bunch of other random garbage. There's test data that I use across the entire reports. Here's a good example of a failed test report, the giant red screen. So what I was telling you, uh, great reporting. This is really the biggest problem in testing that most uh, QA, at least manager and up level have, which is how do I tell my boss how bad is our product today? <laughs> so here's a good example. Hey boss, we passed 64 out of six test cases. We're doing pretty good. Uh, you can actually set with tags, you can get a little bit more creative. Here I've got uh, all the various APIs. I can say almost immediately, we've got some kind of asset problem. Uh, REST handler, there's a problem with that. I failed two out of two tests. Uh, oh, UI authentication and login. You mentioned something about authentication issues. So there's a problem with that test. And then that this is just the listing by tag. And then I've also got a listing by the actual test cases. So each test case here shows up with what failed, what passed. I'll show you a good example. No way, Selenium Firefox test failed. <laughs> All right. This is a basic UI test that checks for the EULA. Message, elements not enabled. Uh, let's see, so if I look at the EULA page, Tam, you accept button, why aren't you enabled? <laughs> All right, so that you can see how quick I was able to just say, and obviously I've already looked at this, but really, <laughs> if my boss were to look at this report, he could click and see that test failed and be like, hey, he's probably got a screenshot of that if it's a UI test. Uh, or you can keep clicking on it and you can actually see the full detail of that test case. So run test setup, that is green. Uh, return the browser object, that, that's how I failed at creating the library. Phantom login, so that passed. And keep clicking if I want, if I really want to see it. It says found username field, login in. That should be true. Expected login result says found username field logging in. All right, phantom accept EULA. EULA found scrolling. Found accept button, clicking. Timeout waiting for pages load. So it tried to click the accept button and fail. Now that's not it. That's not all. <laughs> this is only the info log level. I can go all the way to trace and it will give me all the rest of the garbage that nobody's boss ever wants to see about what happened. <laughs> all the way down to the traceback error that I caught when that element was not enabled. So that's, uh, that's a quick demo of how poorly Selenium works and how <laughs> <laughs> All right, what else should I show? Oh, I was gonna show you real quick the uh, hidden phantom test structure or all the rest. So like I said, they're all, all the test cases fit into kind of a structure, but it's kind of, this was the hard part that I battled with for a while when I first got started was how do I organize my structure? Uh, I'm out of time, but I'm gonna you kick me out if you want. Okay. So test cases, they're all in folders. So kind of like what you saw in the report, I've got a folder that is set up, a folder that arrests rest test, a folder that is some other tests, system test, bug reproduction, UI test, et cetera. So you start with these, which are suites. They have numbers because robot runs them based on how they are listed in the file directories. And then you can just start digging down. There's setup, to rest, I've got off. Assets, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Yeah, let's get some questions in. Sure. Starting with me. Uh, <laughs> why, why is there a dunder init.txt? Okay, so the init in these folders. This one just forces that any tests within that folder get those tags. Gotcha. And that documentation. So I don't even have to tell each individual test what tag they get. Other questions? Yeah. Does your boss actually click on failed tests? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. 
We <laughs> the fifth. <laughs> sure. Uh, at my level, no. Uh, but, the, but whoever manages manages the developers would have to. He might. I mean, in this case, usually, he, I mean, we are a small startup. This is a beautiful space, by the way. We are probably one fourth this size right now. So, uh, no, he yells at me what's going on, and I tell him across the room what's going on. <laughs> How long does your full test suite take to run? Uh, this, so the, the smoke test, not the full test suite. Uh, our current smoke test is about 25, 26 minutes, 11 seconds. Okay. Keep in mind, you said you are testing networking hardware. No, in this so case, I'm, I work at Phantom. We make software only. However, know. part of what our product does is talk to the internet and other, we have 120 apps for our platform. They go out and talk to the network. So some of the things do rely on communicating to the outside world. And the robot, does it manage sort of like parallelization? No. OK. <laughs> I've never heard of Phantom. What exactly does it do? Uh, so it's a security platform. We we allow our customers to automate their security process. Um, I can give you a ninety second pitch. I don't know if that's appropriate. Let's talk about it. We can talk about it after. Sure. All right. Yeah. Cool. cool. Well, yeah. Thank you, David. Thank you, And we are hiring. So apparently, uh, what is your company called? Phantom. Phantom, yes. Um, We're here in Palo Alto, Embarcadero in 101, not the nice side of Palo Alto. But. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, and if anyone wants to work in the uh, North of Sonar side of Palo Alto, uh, Dr. David? Yep. Um, and he'll hook you up. Yeah, um, we have full soft, we have software developer roles, C, Python, front end, QA, obviously. Uh, and we make it fit for a startup. We want smart people. Cool. Um, um, I guess we all didn't mention, but uh, Shopee is hiring uh, for uh, all kinds of positions. Talk to Mahmoud or me or Kurt. Sure, Kurt is the next speaker. You can get set up, like, in case it also takes a while. Um, any, any other announcements? I mean, this is technically lightning talk, man. This is for like if you have a project, talk, that sort of thing. Announcements, and the that's like the last kind of announcement time. So, um, yes, you can go up and, or you can just stop. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, you can, you can borrow first, sure. Okay. Maybe. I'm not going to get it working. Um, yes, in the meantime, while we get uh, computers to work, which is of course impossible, um, <laughs> I have a uh, short, uh, I guess, announced, totally between announcement and lightning talk. I've been working on a small uh, library called Gather uh, for plugins. There's like half a dozen of plugin libraries in Python, uh, but obviously Gather is the best. It also has the nicest name. I can't believe that PyPI Gather was not taken until now. Uh, so uh, if you're interested in having uh, in having a plugin framework, uh, and you think that uh, Gather sounds like a good name, I can, uh, come talk to me. Um, and um, so, so far, we, we are using it in production in Shopkick. Uh, it's it's like, uh, only a week old. Uh, so it does have some uh, uh, kind of newness problems. But so far, it's been awesome. Uh, and, uh, please join me on this journey. Um, cool. um, so, uh, I'm Jan. Hello, everyone. Um, Jan. So I don't know if this ever happened to you. You write a Python script to automate something, and eventually you need a parameter for it. So like, I don't really want to use argparse for this because <laughs> it's like, oh, add option this. And it's like, I have to look up the documentation and everything. What if you just wrote a Python function? So with Clice, you can do just that. Uh, so easy, you just write a Python function with uh, parameters. And let's make that bigger. Uh, OK, you, go, you just write a Python function uh, with parameters, so keyword parameters. Or if, you, if you're on Python 2, there's decorators you can use. And it just starts a command line space for you. That's it. You're done. So the name of the library is Christ, C-L-I-Z-E. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it looks good. It's a <laughs>
seen Google Fire. <laughs> yes, I've seen Google Fire. This is better because it can uh, it actually cares whether you put uh, a parameter as positional or keywords. Fire just makes it like both, which mm -hmm. is a bit odd. That is weird. Uh, I don't know if Google Fire uses your doc strings to make uh, strings compatible. Uh, help? Okay, great. Sure. Uh, it doesn't do decorators that I know of. Nice. Uh, if you have decorators on your functions because you reuse code across your functions, it works. It just works. Uh, what else? I don't know. A full comparison is too new. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, my theory about Google Fire was that they let that go open source just to get on Amazon's nerves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, John. Uh, I actually uh, wrapped up a project recently. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, we all have docs, that's how you know it's done. Um, and basically, I also have... you have gather docs? Yes. Yeah. Well, all right, I haven't CR'd that. So basically, uh, at, at some point uh, or another, you've dealt with URLs. You've been on the internet, right? Somehow you have gotten to a page before. And uh, like, you know, <laughs> in fact, the first talk uh, I gave at Peninsula when I was filling in for a who was sick uh, was about URLs and how they're kind of complex. And so I worked on a library uh, that actually sort of encapsulates all of that complexity. And um, yeah, it's, it's been a really, really fun project. Uh, hyperlink is immutable URLs uh, that is extracted from the Twisted framework and melded with a bunch of other logic that updates it for IPv6 and uh, a lot of other URL complexities. I'll save you, um, you know, the details for after if you'd like. But the docs all work, and I have coverage. <laughs> and uh, man, it's been an arduous thing. But uh, yeah, thank you, Mark, for help on the coverage. What's up? Scroll up. You want me to scroll up somewhere? Yeah, uh, keep going. Keep going. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. One of the signatures is like object, object, the wrapper. Uh, yeah, that, that's what I, I want to see it. I want to oh, see okay. it. So, okay. There it is. <laughs> <laughs> These are sentinel objects. This is a common uh, pattern to have, right? Yeah. So this is how you detect if something is unset. Uh, but yeah, you see, if you look at the actual code, it says um, unspecified, 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 unspecified. You can fix that. Uh, yes. And I, in Just both times, I. Yeah, in boltons, I actually do that. This is a twisted style, and I haven't decided. <laughs> That's hard. It. it is. It is. Uh, everything is twisted style. So uh, yeah, if you have questions about URLs or hyperlink in particular, I'm really happy to talk about them. Okay, now we're all together. Um, yeah, I mean, this isn't really a good idea, right? You just told me uh, earlier today that you wanted to change the public API. You're just going to expose it to all these innocent guys. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's backwards compatible. Okay. okay. I keep backwards compatible. And then now forever there's going to be. So uh, yeah, gather allows you to gather up plugins, because every Python uh, command line and other form of application deserves plugins. So uh, yeah, basically you structure your plugins like a, uh, a pip installable package, right? And then you can install them with extras and all this other stuff. Yeah. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. I guess uh, um, any other uh, any any anyone else hiring? Moshe, <laughs> you have a job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone looking for a job and wants to come up and say a few words? Uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, then let's uh, let's crack this up. Sure. Classic Valley, everyone's employed. <laughs> <laughs> I actually knew a guy who was employed twice. Uh, he, he worked oh, for Oracle yeah. and PayPal at the same time for over three years. <laughs> and he only got caught because he accidentally wore the wrong name tag to a, a sort of company remote <laughs> thing. And uh, but it's pretty amateur. I mean, yeah. who, who here is not on their first job, right? Like, you, you've all had it, right? And you've had a job probably when you interviewed. Right? So the secret is just don't quit your first job uh, when you accept the second one, and then no one will check on you. <laughs> as long as your boss is working remotely from Chicago, you can pull it off. Increasingly, they are. Increasingly, bosses are working remotely from Chicago. So. Many of that pro tips. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm Kurt. I'm going to give a talk about validating structured inputs. And I made up two new words, template schemas and language-native schemas. 
and I think you'll you'll hopefully be ready to talk that this this is uh, justified new words and uh, they're really cool and we should use these more. So first, uh, what, what's what's the name to talk? First, we're going to start with the bitter salad of the current situation of trying to validate structured data. Then we're going to move on to sort of an ideal soup of what we imagine a perfect solution might look like. Then we're going to move on to the main course of how we can actually achieve this. And then for dessert, we're going to have some sweet use cases and a Q&A. So first, the, the, the current problem. Let's say we have a, a structured message, something like this, and you want to write a specification that will uh, encapsulate this. You don't have to worry about your code dealing with uh, bad inputs. The first thing that may come to mind is something like JSON schema. The problem with JSON schema is that you know you end up with something like this, and it only gets worse and worse as the size of your, your messages get larger. So in practice, what actually happens is you actually do something like this, and maybe you feel a little bit guilty that you didn't validate your input, but you kind of cross your fingers, hope for the best, maybe you get a value error, maybe you get a type error, maybe you silently ignore uh, bad data. But if only it was easier to write the schemas, we'd we write them more. So ideally, we'd like something that looks kind of like this, right? You, you, you just want to say that, that uh, you want a, a, a simple uh, schema that looks pretty much like the message that you're validating instead of, instead of uh, being hugely complicated. And basically the idea is that um, when, you're, when you're looking at this, you can kind of eyeball it and get a pretty good idea of what it's going to validate. Um, so you, you may say that this, this isn't a fair example because that JSON schema was actually doing a lot more work than this little simple schema. But really that whole like uh, three, three column JSON schema, this was all the extra uh, validation it was applying to its values. So this encapsulates the exact same level of validations that JSON schema does. But I think you'll agree like much, much more smaller and readable. Um, so uh, the, the other thing that we'd like is uh, we want the, the, the schema to be like a native data structure in the language. So for example, if you need to do something like recursive, you look at uh, a JSON schema, not to click on JSON schema, but uh, it's just an example people are probably familiar with. Uh, you have to make IDs and stuff to achieve recursion. In, in this example, uh, we want to represent uh, directories and files uh, with some kind of a schema where we just say, okay, uh, a directory is a dictionary uh, with uh, string keys and it contains files, which are strings, or subdirectories, which are uh, you know sub dictionaries with with uh, substring keys, and we can represent that by simply making a recursive data structure in Python. Um, and you get a lot of other other benefits too. It's it's uh, it's easier to integrate with other libraries. Uh, it's easier to manipulate your schemes. You say, if only such a library existed. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, luckily, uh, such a library does exist. It's called schema. So, so, so all those uh, examples that we're looking at are, are, are valid uh, schemas using the schema library. And there's, uh, there's basically four key rules that you can use to write uh, valid schemas. There's uh, uh, values match themselves. Containers will recurse downwards. Types will match instances of that type. And callables will be evaluated as predicates. So the first very simple rule, uh, uh, a schema of some constant will simply check that the, the validating expression is equal to that constant. So like schema of one, you know, validates uh, one. Uh, so containers for list tuples and sets, uh, a, a uh, container containing the schema will check that that subschema validates each of the items in that list, set, or tuple. For dictionaries, the key end value can be a schema, and it will, it will simply uh, recurse downwards and apply the subschema to all the keys and all the all the values. Uh, for types, uh, uh, type match instances. So we already saw some examples of that, like str and int. It's uh, pretty intuitive. And uh, callables are evaluated as predicates. So this means anytime you put a callable in as a schema, uh, it will be called with the current value, and if it returns true, that means it validates. If it returns anything uh, not true or raises an exception, that means it doesn't, doesn't validate. Uh, there's a couple other uh, utility things. Uh, there's an end conjoinment, which is you can take two schemas and uh, uh, apply both of them to the same data. There's or, you can apply either. And there's use, which lets you transform a value as it's being validated. Uh, also, error messages are, are very nice in the trunk version of the code. This isn't uh, quite released yet. We have an open GitHub issue. If you guys want to go uh, thumbs up it, maybe we can get them to do a release in 2017. 
Okay. And, and uh, so for dessert, we've got some sweet use cases. Uh, so you can see uh, how, how smooth it is to use this library. So, so this is a nice, uh, nice example, I think. So, so we have a string that represents a path on the disk. And we want to be able to, uh, to take a tilde path and expand it into a, a, an absolute path. And then we want to check that the path actually exists. And we want, want to do that all in the validation layer so that our code doesn't have to worry about you know, trying to be open a file that doesn't exist. And the, the nice thing is, uh, there's tons of things in the standard library that already predicates. So you can just drop them straight into your schemas. And uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's this example. Um, uh, another example of, uh, of smooth integration, there's this other library out there called uh, Adders. And what it basically does is it gives you sort of uh, declarative objects where you uh, uh, describe uh, the fields of your object and it auto-generates uh, init and a wrapper and uh, uh, equal operator, uh, some, some utility things like that. So we can integrate uh, schema and attrib together. And in addition to declaring your fields, you can also declare the schema of your fields. So this is just the code to do that. Uh, and we, we make this uh, schema adder uh, factory. And then we can do stuff like this. So we can sort of declaratively, uh, so this is, this is from some code that we use. This is representing a, a Docker image. But the main thing just to see is that you can, you can uh, have these, uh, schemas applied to the inputs to your constructor uh, and you don't have to worry inside your class about um, uh, dealing with invalid data. No, another example, uh, it's really easy to write helper functions. So let's say, for example, you have some port. You, you can take the port input as a string and uh, convert it to an integer uh, with, with this, this kind of helper function. Another example, you might want to assert that a port is inside the uh, valid range. Uh, for example, uh, Python standard library does some bad things if you give it an integer that's outside the range of uh, valid ports. Uh, and last example, uh, this is another one from, from our code. You, you may have some, some configuration file that lets you specify a git remote, but what if you type up a git remote? For example, is it a colon or a slash? Off the top of your head, is it a colon or a slash when it's HTTP or when it's git? For the for the uh, Git remote, um, and and this will kind of uh, validate that, uh, so that instead of uh, getting a, a Git throwing, throwing some weird error uh, way downstream, you can validate it right when you parse the configuration file. Um, and uh, that's the presentation. Uh, this schema's uh, hit install schema. Um, I hope, hope you guys use it. First of all, I'd like to comment that that regex is an example of why hyperlink is really important. <laughs> um, because Mockman could have kind of work into getting the schemas right, um, which is really, really nice. And then the second question, I, that was a question. My actual question is, um, <laughs> what about voluptuous? The reason, because like scheme, the schema, if there are multiple um, errors in the schema, does schema of the library like raise an exception for on the first error, or does it like record multiple errors and tell you all? Because Voluptuous does that. I think it's the only library that I know of that does that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, the main advantage of schema, there's, there's a lot of libraries in the space. The main advantage of schema is the terseness of the schema definition. Mm -hmm. And the idea is there's use cases where you're not going to mm -hmm. actually take the time to write anything. So okay. say, like, the, the, main, the main competition to schema is not, you know, JSON I'm, schema or anything else. The main competition is, is this. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so it's like, let, let, let's do something at least. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. What about network messages? Uh, network messages schema is probably not the best tool. Um, for, for one thing, you probably don't want a language specific network message. You want something that's going to be uh, going to be cross language. And for other thing, uh, network messages is, is is there's already a lot of tools in that area. There's much less tools in the area of saying like I've got some you know semi structured data coming out of a configuration file or something like this. Else I don't want to keep asking. <laughs> no, you're do you, good. Do you have a like a? Is, do you have any solution for serialization for the other for going the other direction? Oh, oh uh, you, so checking that your output is structured. Right, or is it, is it schema? I don't think it's not bidirectional, but like it would be nice to like. I know Adders has asdict, which mm -hmm. lets you emit the dictionary. Is that do you just like based on serializing as it go from there? Do you have any 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 suggestions for how to deal with? Okay. Egress of the data, not just the ingress. Yeah, yeah. Well, well it's interesting. If, if you combine it with adders, um, you can get the nice property of. So, one, one, uh, uh, one problem with adders, ASDIC, 
is that you lose all the type information, so you can no longer like bidirectional. If you uh, if you uh, you can construct the, the use keyboard, um, uh, and thereby you can you can wire up a type to a field using a schema adder, mm -hmm. and now you can get bidirectional. You can get as dict, mm -hmm. and then you can reconstruct it back from the dictionary. Mm -hmm. And so that's maybe an interesting possibility to uh, to to get. Uh, yeah, but but I think I think it you need. Um, you need some kind of declarative structure like adder before it really makes sense because schema yeah. is just in the business of, of, of validating the data structure. So sure, you, make, you know, send me a giant dictionary and I can validate it again before I write a disk, but you probably don't want to write a bunch of code assembling a, a giant dictionary. Oh, yeah. If you have multiple fields of data structure you want to validate across several things, can you do that? Um, so you have multiple fields in a bar and baz, and you care about the group bar and baz together as opposed to separate. Oh yes, absolutely. So 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 the 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 generally the way that you combine uh, if you if you have conditions that that sort of work together, like you say we want to say hey I want to check that foo is equal to bar, for example, but I don't care which values foo and bar have. The way you can uh, uh, you can basically achieve that uh, via via lambdas at a higher level. So um, I'm not sure if this is if this is uh, your your use case. So let, let's say let's say you uh, you say we've got foo and it has some some value, and we have a, a bar and it has some value. And don't care what the values are, but I care that they're equal. Is, is that is that sort of the one? Oh, sure. So so what you can do is say oops. Okay, and then we can uh, so th th there we go. We can achieve that kind of a, a thing. It, you be, the, the, the the nice thing is that you have this lambda is sort of like an escape valve. So the answer to anything you can dream of is, is like yes you can do it with with enough lambda uh, you know with enough lambda hammer you can. <laughs> in these cases, so we use this for our configuration validation. Um, in these cases, I recommend using like a named function because uh, basically, as users are going to write more configs, uh, like they want to see that lambda failed on that value, right? They want to see okay. that like you know who equals var failed. Yeah, that's a good thing too. So, so like the, it also, I think it does a pretty tasteful thing on the error messages. It yeah. tells you whether the function name, which would be better to use your own function name, it tells you the arguments that function got passed as it should evaluate the truth. So kind of uh, easy to do that. All right. Thank, thank you very much for your time. Okay. So once again, we reached the end of a, another congregation of tiny souls. It's not really the end. It's just the end of the talks. Because after all, it was all about coming together as one uh, and hanging out and talking about some Python in a particular place. Is there beer left? I <laughs> <laughs> uh, but We still have a space for about an hour. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, feel free to hang out and stuff. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you all for coming, and uh, let's chat some more after, okay? All right. Follow us on Twitter. Twitter and if you have Instagram, then we have like two, uh, two Instagram accounts.